Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago. The final few, few verses of chapter 6 and the first five verses of chapter 7, book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 6, starting in verse 26, down through Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. Now, as you know, we did a three-week study on genealogies, uh, some very important things that we learned as we went through those portions of the text and looked at a few of the uh, people who were listed for us there in that text. We learned some very important critical foundational facts that can help us here as we move into chapter 7, because now God is telling Moses to get moving, to start doing what God has told him to do. It's interesting how many times, and we'll see that in a bit, how many times God has to tell Moses to get moving. <laughs> should be an encouragement to us because we don't often get moving when God tells us to get moving. God is very patient. He's very kind with Moses. And so once again, he's going to tell us, this is the Moses that God said to him, get moving. And now God says to him again, get moving. And Moses finally, when we get to verse 6 next week, the Lord willing, Moses and Aaron finally get moving. <laughs> Folks, do you know what God's will is for your life? Do you know what God's will is for your life? Oh, you don't know all the details yet. We are aware of that. But do you know what God's will is for your life? It is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You know the principles. You know how it comes about. We've done detailed studies on the will of God. We've done detailed studies on motivations so that we make sure we're in the will of God and not in the will of the flesh. You have the word of God you know what God's will is for your life. The question is, have you started moving on it yet? We hope to answer that question next week as we look at Moses and Aaron, but for today, our background study for this was inspiration of genealogical passages. Never overlooked that fact. God gave them for four specific reasons. So we might know what is good doctrine for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It was so that we might become spiritually mature, that the man of God might be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So study of genealogy will help you to mature spiritually. The fourth thing that we learned was God teaches how sin has permeated this entire human race through genealogies. And we looked at those phrases, and he died. Fifth, we saw that God uses genealogies to teach us the history of redemption from sin because genealogies show us that God has worked over long stretches of history to defeat sin and Satan and time and chance and temptation and the world and the flesh to accomplish through human beings who are sinful his sovereign plan of redemption by sending the promised Savior. And as we noted last week, it's incredible, but God uses people to accomplish his will. He gets the glory, but he does use people. He promised to send a Redeemer in Genesis 3, 14 and 15. He fulfilled that promise as proved by the genealogies. We never heard most of those people before. I read a few of the genealogies to you. We never heard of most of those people before, yet every one of them was essential as a link in God's eternal plan to sovereignly bring about redemption. Most of those people never knew that they fit into the plan, had no idea when it was coming, how it was coming, or that they would even be part of it. God chooses insignificant people. That means he chooses us. That's why you and I are here today. We are insignificant. We're not important as far as the world is concerned, but in the plan of God, he has a very specific slot for you as an individual within his sovereign plan to bring about his greatest amount of glory and your greatest good if you are one of his children. We saw the tracking last week of Mary's genealogy in the Gospel of Luke shows and proves to us the human ancestry of Jesus. That was a critical point to make. All the way back to Adam, when you read Luke chapter 3, we see the human ancestry of Jesus through Mary as a virgin. The Matthew genealogy gives us Joseph's genealogy and establishes the legal right to the throne. But Mary traces through Nathan instead of Coniah. Mary traces through an uncursed son and Joseph traces through a cursed son. We concluded that most of us know nothing about most of the people in our own genealogies, much less in this entire genealogy that we've just read here. 
But we also saw that just because you're a big shot, like Solomon, for example, doesn't mean that the end of your impact will be as big as a brother or sister who never seemed to get ahead. Solomon was big, big stuff when he was around. His brother Nathan is hardly mentioned at all, another one of Bathsheba's sons. God doesn't choose the people that men think are great. 1 Corinthians 1, 25-29, we read that last week. Every person is essential in the plan of God. There are no extra cogs, no extra wheels, no extra pulleys, no extra belts, no extra little gizmos that just sort of hang around doing nothing like you would see in a Rube Goldberg invention. Every part is essential to the plan of God and that means you are essential. We saw that in Romans chapter 8. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what he's doing with you. That's what he's doing with me. It takes every one that he has chosen, whom he has elected, to be conformed to the image of his Son, to bring him the greatest amount of glory. That's what Romans 8 is talking about that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brothers. We saw that in the book of Hebrews last week, emphasizing his humanity. I began stretching your mind a little bit last week when we looked at that genealogy of Mary. We observed that the same maternal genealogy applies to Mary's other children by her husband Joseph. But every one of them, because Joseph was their father, was descended from the cursed line of Coniah. They could never sit upon the throne. Only Jesus could. The Bible made it clear that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary had at least four sons and two daughters by Joseph. We read the passages out of Matthew and Mark. The early church, we find that the brothers did not initially believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but later they did, and one of them became the moderator of the First Council of Jerusalem, Acts 15. We see that he received Paul on his return from his third missionary journey. We read that in Acts 21. We saw that he was the author of the book of James in the New Testament. This is a physical half-brother of Jesus Christ. He was married, and so were the other brothers of Christ. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 9.5. We concluded if the half-brothers and half-sisters of Jesus had children, there may be, we don't know for sure, but there may be people in the world today that are genetically related to Christ. And it's not, as we said, the outrageous claim of the Da Vinci Code of Ron Brown that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and that she's the Holy Grail who bore children to him. But I stretched your mind even further than that. The genuine humanity of Christ is proved by his genealogy, which is traced back through Noah to Adam. Paul calls Christ the second Adam because his work undoes what Adam did, reverses the curse of sin for those who are in Christ, even as those who are in Adam all die. That means that you and I are genetically related to Jesus Christ, some place back along the line to Noah and Adam. The genuine humanity of Christ is one of the key elements of the gospel. He is literally the seed of David. Romans chapter 1 says so. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ tasted death for every human being because the first Adam brought death upon the entire human race. That gives him the right to raise the dead for judgment, both the saved and the lost. You knew he tasted death for every man. I hope you knew that. Hebrews 2.9 But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. In the same context, we're also called brothers and were called sons. This is the verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory. We are sons of God by faith in Christ to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that is sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. Listen to this verse 11. Did you know that Jesus calls you his brother? For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, Paul goes on here in Hebrews chapter 2 to emphasize that point, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, 
I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. Listen to it carefully in verse 14. For as much then as the children, that you and me, are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same, that is, flesh and blood. He's really human. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. He had to become human so that he could taste of death for us. So he could reverse what Adam did, bringing death into the world. And deliver them who through fear of death. Are you afraid of death? I hope not. I hope that after you've placed your faith in Christ, you're not afraid of it. Because Jesus came to not only deliver you and give you salvation, but he came to deliver you from the fear of death. Deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We do so many things because we're afraid of dying. Oh, we avoid this. We do that. We do the other thing because we're afraid of dying. We never take a risk for Christ because of what might happen. Did you know, if you never take a risk for Christ, there is no need for faith? Think about that. If you never take a risk for Christ, there is no need for faith. And so what difference is there between you and the world? We are called to walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 16, again the emphasis on his humanity. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He's genetically related to David, it says so in the text. He's genetically related to Abraham, it says so in the text. Wherefore, in all things, not in a few things, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That is, he's 100% human. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, that is, come to the aid of, them that are tempted. Say, Jesus was tempted? Well, when you and I think of temptation, you and I think of uh, falling into temptation. Don't confuse two things. Temptation is an attack. Temptation is not the yielding to the attack. Temptation is the attack. Let me give you an illustration. Suppose that you had a fortress 1,000 feet high with walls that were 200 feet thick and gates of solid steel that were four feet thick. And you close the gates because here you see the Apaches or the Comanches coming over the rise on their horses with their bows and arrows and giving their war hoops. And they attack. But you got the gates closed. And they come up to the gate with their stone hammers and they go banging on the gates. And they shoot their arrows as far up as they can, but it can't go a thousand feet up. And they set fires to the bottom trying to burn it out. But it's made out of stone, not out of wood. Now, has a genuine attack taken place? Yeah, they're giving all they've got. They're attacking as hard as they can. Are they going to be able to get in? No. Temptation is the attack. You and I, because we are weak and frail, and always give in to temptation, or at least most of the time, we think of temptation as succumbing to the attack. Temptation is the attack. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Another thought here. This is not in my notes. Teaching theology at this moment. Was Jesus... Now there's a difference between these two questions. Listen carefully. Was Jesus able not to sin or was Jesus not able to sin was Jesus able not to sin or was Jesus not able to sin now I'll let you chew on that for a little while maybe I'll talk about it later but um, 
Anyway, let's move on. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He knows where the attacks are going to come. He knows what the plans of the enemy are. He knows how the devil tries to get through to you because Satan attacked him in all those same areas. Read Matthew 4. If you are human, and I trust that you are, I see nobody with antennas out here. If you are human, you are genetically related to Jesus Christ. He was and is truly man. That is why, as the book of Hebrews tells us here, he could be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He understands it. That is why he could shed his blood. If he wasn't human, he couldn't. That is why he could die for your sins and for mine. He gave his life to save family members, the ones that he loved. By the way, do you know that is why the scripture calls us, quote, sons of God. Not in the unique sense of son of God that applies to Christ and his deity, but the scripture calls us sons of God for two reasons. Because both we are his biologically related brothers and his spiritual brothers as those who have trusted him by faith. That's why the Bible calls us sons of God. You say, where does it say that? Well, lots of places, as a matter of fact. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become, quote, the sons of God. Who are they? What's the next phrase say? Even to them that believe on his name. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the... You got it. How about Romans 8, 19? For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the... You're good. Pretty good. I didn't know you guys knew so much scripture. Uh, Philippians 2, 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. How about 1 John 3, 1? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called? Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. How about 1 John 3, 2? Be beloved, now are we the... And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. If you've trusted Christ... You fit that category of those who are the sons of God, those who are being led by the Spirit of God, those who are looking forward with eager expectation to the return of Christ, those who are living as lights in the world, blameless and harmless, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you are a son of God, and this is a show of the love that the Father has bestowed upon us. And it does not yet appear what we, whom the scripture calls the sons of God, will be. But it's going to be glorious, magnificent. We have hints of it as we read the prophetic scriptures and as we, we hear of the resurrection body. And we find Paul's description in Romans chapter 15 of what it's going to be like. And the different things he compares it to. Incredible and glorious and never able to die again. Destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil and delivered those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Why should we be afraid? Through faith in Christ, we become sons of God. Not as Jesus, the Son of God, which is a declaration of his deity, but sons of God, through faith in him, who redeemed us and bought us with his blood. Now, before moving on today, I want to say a few things about several elements that we just brushed over in that previous list of genealogies. Other than the statements of how long individuals lived, and you'll see that some of them lived 130 years, some lived 137 years, and you find those comments in that list of genealogical heads of the tribes that are given to us in the preceding verses. But other than that, there are only four statements dealing with something about the life of particular individuals in that genealogy. Now, other genealogies give us additional information about some people. But when God breaks into a genealogy, and he gives you a statement in that genealogy about that person, it's because he wants us to sit up and pay attention. He has something to teach us as we look at that particular statement. So other than the statements of how long various individuals lived, only a few have these additional comments, which sets them apart and makes them quite significant. 
If you look back at your Bibles there, to Exodus chapter 6, verse 15, where it's listing this genealogy, it says, And the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Yamin, and Ohad, and Yachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, which is the name Saul, the son of a Canaanitish woman. These are the families of Simeon. Interesting. Why in the world did it pull out the one to let us know that um, Simeon had a Canaanitish woman who bore him a son? I think it's because God is giving here a rebuke and a reminder of Simeon's hypocrisy. Which, by the way, God does record in books what you do. There's not merely the book of life, which we find in the book of Revelation, but it talks about the dead are judged according to their works. God brings out the books, plural. They're not judged for salvation, but they're judged according to their works. What's the level of reward? What's the level of punishment? I uh, wish we had time for that today. But you remember Simeon? Who was Simeon? Simeon was one of the sons of Jacob. Okay. He was one of the sons of Jacob. Jacob had some daughters. Do any of you remember a daughter by the name of Dinah? Anybody remember Dinah? Okay, a few of you remember Dinah. Okay, Dinah is there. She gets a whole chapter of the Bible. If Dinah gets a whole chapter of the Bible, it means that Dinah is important. Why don't you know about Dinah? Okay, Genesis 34. Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel, and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem heard unto and Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor the father of Shechem went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. If you need no other text against the the sin, the wicked sin of fornication, premarital sex. You got it right here. Which thing ought not to be done? And Amor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her to him to wife. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get your possessions therein. So in other words, let's make one big happy family, one big tribe. Hey, we can increase, increase our influence, and we can increase our money. This will make us all wealthier if we join together. That's what he's saying to him here. This is great stuff. Hey, good. Let's, let's intermarry here. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift. I will give according as ye say unto me, but give me the damsel the wife. It's already defiled her. But he really, 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 really likes her. Wow. Love at true first sight. Hey, I'll pay anything for this girl. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully, and said, Because he had defiled Dinah their sister, they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you. Now here they're lying through their teeth. If ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. Boy, talk about going against the promises of God. Of course, they're lying. Not paying much attention to what God hears. Though it's going to show up later here in our text today in the book of Exodus. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And the young man deferred not to do this thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than all his father's house. Now, if this fornicator was the most honorable person in town, what was the rest of town like? And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came into the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore, let us dwell in the land and trade with them. Man, this is good for business. Do you guys like good business? Well, here's the way we get good business. It's a little thing to get good business. 
For the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives. Let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent for us to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male, you know, not 99%, every one of us, got to be circumcised as they are circumcised. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? <laughs> love of money is the root of all evil. Not money is the root of all evil. The love of money. Covetousness will destroy you. The Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5 that covetousness is idolatry and that the covetous man is an idolater. We may not be like these guys falling down in front of funny little wooden statues, but for covetous, we're idolaters. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of the sons of Jacob, listen to who they are, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. Those guys couldn't fight. They were so sore. They could hardly walk. They slew all the males and they slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. And the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen, their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said unto Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites. Shaul, the son of a Canaanitish woman, and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? Do you get the impression that Simeon is a hypocrite? He had at least one child by a Canaanitish woman. And yet he's bent out of shape that this Hivite, who lives among the Canaanites of the land, has taken his sister. The second person about whom some comment is made here is in verse 20. And Amram took him Yochebed, Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. And the light, years of the life of Amram were in 130 and seven years. In other words, when you read that, and you can read all the commentaries, both Jewish commentaries and evangelical commentaries and liberal commentaries, they all come to the same conclusion. Amram married his blood aunt. This means that not only was she Moses and Aaron's mother, that means she was Moses and Aaron's great aunt. Now, how do you swallow that one? Well, this is a reminder that marriage prior to the giving of the law was less restricted than it is after the law. Old Testament marriage law, the permissions and the prohibitions, particularly the marriage of those with close bloodlines, is very complex. We're not going to deal with that entire thing. That's a humongous subject about Old Testament marriage laws and how does that come over into the New Testament and all that kind of stuff. But answering the one question here in relation to this passage, However, a demonstration of the constricting nature of marriage throughout Bible history is seen in the question that unbelievers often challenge Christians with. So, we're going to take you back even farther in Old Testament history than this point here. Have you ever heard somebody ask the question, where did Cain get his wife? Good question. Where did Cain get his wife? I mean, we have listed for us Cain and Abel and Seth. So where did Cain get his wife? And they think that's going to stump you. The answer is he married his sister. Prior to the generation of the gene pool, this was not prohibited. How do we know he had a sister? Because the Bible says so. Genesis chapter 5, verse 4. And the days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. See, most of us stop our thinking when we get back to the law, and we know that that kind of stuff was not permitted. It's not. It's not permitted today either. Don't try to do it. But that was what was going on prior to the giving of the law. You know that Abraham married his half-sister. 
Genesis 20, verse 12. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. <laughs> He's trying to get out of having lied about Sarah being his sister to Pharaoh. Of course, the restrictions today are a whole lot greater, and we, we don't have time to go into all of that, but folks, this is not the examples for you to follow. Third, the next two verses are reminders that mothers have an incredible impact on the character development of their children. I'm going to give you two different verses out of Exodus chapter 6 that we read that list. Remember I said there were four places in that list of genealogies where uh, something special is said about individual people. Exodus 6.23 And Aaron that's one of the sons of Amram took him Elisheba, daughter of Amminadab sister of Naashon to wife. <laughs> They wanted you to know for sure who his wife was. They didn't tell you who everybody else's wives are. But they want you to know for sure who Aaron's wife was. She is the daughter of Aminadab. She is the sister of Nashon. And she bears four kids. We don't have just one mentioned as you're going like through the rest of this list here. Four of them are mentioned. She bare him Nadab and Abihu. Eliezer and Ithamar. Do you recognize any of those names? I hope you recognize at least two of them. At least the two bad guys. Do you recognize the two bad guys in the list? Nadab and Abihu? She raised all four of these boys. Two of those boys, when they grew up, decided that they were going to offer strange fire before the altar of the Lord, Nadab and Abihu. And God fried them with fire and burned them up. And so the other two, Eliezer and Ithamar, became the high priests after the death of Aaron. Rather interesting. Mothers have an incredible impact on the character development of their children. The second case is mentioned in verse 25. Here is a godly mother who raised a son who was zealous for the Lord. A godly leader, a man who was unashamed to go out front stage and center and take a stand no matter what happened. A man of courage, a man of character. Listen to verse 25. And Eliezer, Aaron's son, took him one of the daughters of Putiel to wife, and she bare him Pinchas, Phineas, middle name of one of my sons. Yeshayahu Pinchas, Jehovah saves from the mouth of the servant. Serpent. I hope you guys can figure out which one that is. These are the heads of the fathers of the Levites according to their families. Who in the world was Phineas? Well, we find him here in verse 25. We find also that when the children of Israel were fornicating with the Moabites under the suggestion of Balaam, in the book of Numbers, it says, And Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And then he stabbed that Israelite man and that Moabitish woman whose name was Cosby through both of them at one stab with his javelin and killed them because he was zealous for the Lord. We find that in verse 11. Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel my jealousy. He turned the wrath of God away from the children of Israel for that fornication es escapade with the, the daughters of Moab. His, his mother's name is mentioned for us. We're told specifically who she was. Numbers 31, 6, And Moses sent them to war, a thousand of every tribe, them, and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to the war, with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. He was a leader. This is the woman that trained him. We get over to the book of Joshua, chapter 22, verse 13. And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead. Remember, they had built a, a big stone altar on the other side, and, and, and those who had come across the Jordan River you know, you know, were wondering, hey, are they going to worship another god? Because 
God had said you're not going to worship anybody else except me. And so they send a delegation over to find, why in the world did you build that altar over there on the other side of the river? They sent them into the land of Gad. Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, he heads it up. He's checking out to see whether apostasy is going on in the camp. We get to verse 30. And when Phineas the priest and the princes of the congregation and the heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him heard the words of the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh speaking unto them, it pleased them. They said, no, this is so that we'll never forget and so that our children will never forget. It's not because we're worshiping a different God. It's because we're part of you. And we don't want our children to forget that just because they live on the other side of the river. Verse 31, And Phineas the son of Elias the priest said unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because ye have not committed this trespass against the Lord. Now ye have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phineas the son of Elias the priest and the princes returned from the children of Reuben and from the children of Gad out of the land of Gilead unto the, unto the land of Canaan to the children of Israel and brought them word again. You see how many times this man is mentioned? Do you want to know why his mother is mentioned? That was a woman of God. That was a woman who raised a son who was zealous for the Lord. Your children, your grandchildren, are you doing everything you can to make them into men and women of God who are zealous for Christ? Who are unashamed? Who will take the bold stand? who will not compromise their theology or their moral practice. Josh, uh, Joshua 24, 33, And Eliezer the son of Aaron died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. That's the son he wanted to be buried under. Judges 20, 28. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. You know the filthy story of the Sodomites among the Benjaminites. Who is leading the charge? Who is inquiring of God as to how to go to battle? Phineas, the son of Eleazar. Four mentions of people in that genealogy. I see our time is running out. We're never going to get all the way through this, but we'll try at least to get a few more. I got three more, four more minutes. There are also other, several other things that I think that need to be mentioned for balance. This is important. For balance, so that we don't end up like Mormons who are obsessed with genealogical records so that they can be baptized for their dead ancestors to try to save them which of course is a misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 15, 29, which says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? And the Mormons think, hey, we've got to do our genealogies, and then we'll go down, we'll pay some money, we'll get ourselves baptized for dead great uncle so-and-so. Let me talk about genealogy for a minute in the balance. The term genealogy is found 15 times in the Old Testament. The singular form is never found in the New Testament, but the singular form is found 15 times in the Old Testament. It always relates to Jews who are part of national Israel, proving either their connection to one of the 12 tribes, or proving their right to the throne, or proving their pedigree for service in the Levitical priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood. Every time that term genealogy, the word itself, is found in the Old Testament 15 times, it relates to one of those four things. Connection to the twelve tribes, right to the throne, pedigree for serving the Levitical priesthood, pedigree for serving the Aaronic priesthood. The term, plural, genealogies, is found eight times in the entire Bible. Six times it's found in the Old Testament, but twice it's found in the New Testament. The word. Now we see genealogies in the New Testament, but the word genealogies is found only two times in the New Testament. The six times in the Old Testament are the same as the singular form, relating always to Jews who are part of national Israel, proving that either a connection to the twelve tribes, right to the throne, pedigree for service in the Levitical priesthood, or pedigree for service in the Aaronic priesthood. However, the two occurrences in the New Testament tell us that this is not to be our focus, because the church is not 
Israel. That's why you find this emphasis on genealogies in the Old Testament. Because it relates to Israel. Not to the church. The church is not Israel. For Israel, physical heritage was essential to tie them to the nation. For the church, spiritual heritage is essential, not physical heritage. Let me read you the two passages. One Paul writing to Timothy and one Paul writing to Titus. The young church planting missionaries that he had set out so that they might establish local churches. And there were certain problems that rose up, and this was one of them. This business of genealogies. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.4 Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. You know, we can get, we can major on the minors, we can get stuck on little things. Now you learn a lot from genealogies. I've already said that. But you can end up majoring on the minors. And there are people who will grab something and beat it to death until that is all they ever talk about. Paul tells us the genealogies are not the major issue. They prove certain things. God included them. They're inspired. But they point to something else, not to themselves. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which mention the questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And then he writes to Titus, Titus chapter 3, verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. You see all the things that's tied together. I wish we had time to talk about them. Our time is up here. Um, but he says avoid it. That's not what you want to spend all your time worrying about is your genealogies. They're unprofitable and vain. It's connection to the law. Unprofitable and vain. You know, I had a great aunt. She was a sister of my grandmother who was really big time into genealogies and she tracked our ancestry back hundreds of years. I think that my uncle, who is still alive, has all of those records. But as a child, I can remember my mom saying that we were related to Winston Churchill because his mother was a Spencer. She also said that on her side of the family, we were related to Bishop Ridley, who was burned at the stake by the Roman Catholics for being a Bible-believing Protestant. She also said that the Emperor Charlemagne was in our ancestral line. <laughs> However, I also know that we had some horse thieves and scoundrels lurking around the shadows of my ancestry. <laughs> in fact, quite a few. That reminds me of an old saying that I once heard. When you look at the branches of your family tree, it's usually like a potato plant. The best part is under the ground. <laughs> the usefulness of genealogies includes demonstrating the accuracy of the Bible in multiple ways. We've seen that. It is very useful, for example, in determining the date of Noah's flood and the date of creation. Now, some people say, well, those are just representative genealogies that are given because they're, you know, there are 10 in this list and there are 10 in this list and they're parallel, just like the 14 generations uh, that Matthew lists and the 14 generations and then another 14 generations. Just yesterday, I got in the mail the newest edition of Biblioteca Sacra, uh, which is the journal put out by Dallas Theological Seminary, quarterly journal. And it has a fascinating study on whether or not the genealogies in Genesis, Genesis concerning all the way back to Adam and then all the way to Noah and from there to Abraham, whether that's a tight genealogy or whether there are big gaps in that genealogy. There are a lot of people who teach there are big gaps in there and that the Bible really can't be trusted on the genealogical record and that the, the numbers are wrong and everything. This guy is meticulous. He checks out not only the Masoretic text, but he checks out the Septuagint, both versions of it. He checks out the Samaritan Pentateuch. He compares all the dates and all of these things. He goes through all the arguments, every which way, and he comes to the conclusion, we have a very tight genealog genealogical record. I agree with him. He thinks that it can be for the date of creation no more than 4,200 years ago. And that the date of the flood is about 2,500 B.C. 4,200 B.C. versus 2,500 B.C. for the date of the flood. I'm giving the approximate dates. Those are easy to remember. 4,200 B.C., 2,500 B.C. Because God wants to show himself strong. Proof who he is. Okay, usefulness of genealogies. That's some of it. Well, I didn't get... 
even to the stuff that I wanted to cover for today. So the Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your power. We thank you that you are the sovereign God. We thank you that you are infinite God, that you have infinite number of details in your plan. And those infinite details include each and every one of us. You care about us as individuals. You care about who our parents were. You care about who our children are. You care about who our great-grandchildren are, our grandchildren. Every generation is sovereignly being moved in a way that will bring you the greatest amount of glory. Father, help us to remember that as we see the practical application from the four different comments that were made in the text about individuals. It reminds us that you are God. It reminds us that we have responsibility as parents, especially mothers, the responsibility for raising godly children, children who are zealous for the Lord, not half and half. Father, we thank you once again that you are God. We pray that you will use each one of us to proclaim the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ to all of those who are around us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 574, A Child of the King. Let's stand to sing all the verses, 574, A Child of the King. Mm -hmm.